Hello, Mark from Spots Music here, and I was just typing up an email, I've been in correspondence with a school that we call on, and their band program and their choir program and their music department has the uh, the needs this year due to all the changes with COVID um, to be able to present their concerts without an actual audience. So that brings us to the recording stage and uh, being able to do recording on your own and I thought this would be a good video with some good information to hopefully help some band directors or some uh, some programs that might be interested into looking at recording themselves because the way that technology is the way that computer-based recording has gotten it is not very expensive to get into being able to multi-track record on your own as individuals as someone that has a home studio or as a, a school band program, uh, orchestra, um, or small ensemble groups, jazz bands, or bands in general. So uh, first off, I want to cover some very basic concepts. Um, I'm going to talk to you about three different, for this application, three different types of recording that you could use in a setting like this. Um, first off, there are portable handheld recorders. I'm actually going to go grab one real quick so I can show you. So handheld recorders, they are small palm size, and you actually probably already own a low quality one. Um, if you have a smartphone, you can actually use those as a handheld recorder. It's exactly what one of these units is gonna do. The stereo mics, like this is a Roland R07, they sell for about $199. Um, the microphone quality versus a cell phone, much better. So uh, a lot of people will run these in professional recording applications doing live. They'll use these for a room mic. You can use these as backup uh, recordings if you're running a computer-based recording program in a live event where electricity went out for 30 seconds and I now I have a backup of it that I can at least edit into that. So there's a great application for these. They work good interview settings, one-on-one -on -one interviews. It's a stereo mic configuration. They work great for acoustics, um, like if you're just playing acoustic and singing and want to capture that, live recordings, things like that. Um, it's not a multi-track recorder though, so it is you hit record on it while well, you set your levels, hit record on it and it is what it is. You can take that file and drop it into a computer to edit it down as far as topping and tailing the tracks um, or changing, adding EQs, compressions, affecting the sound that way. Um, but layering things, you unfortunately don't have that option with these. But for a bare minimum, they are a great tool and get utilized a lot. Um, the second type of recording devices I want to talk to, talk to you about is uh, is multi-track recorders and multi-track recorders they were very very popular back when you could get like the little Tascam Fostec tape machines that were tape recorders you had a little cassette put them in them multi-track recording that way digital versions like Roland and Boss has a BR800 that's a multi-track recorder um, that uh, they start in the I think $400 price range they're a standalone unit that gives you multi-tracking capabilities depending on the size of and the style that you get would depend on how much uh, processing you have as far as editing capabilities effects some of them even have built-in drum machines uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about them because they really in the modern era of recording don't have much application but I do want, do want to make you aware of those two um, that they're out there and they could be an option um, they're just not as easy to use uh, the reason most recordings are done in a computer there are a couple reasons so we we'll, might as well just jump to that third category that we're going to be focusing the most on and that is computer-based recording um, so recording on a laptop or recording on a desktop uh, the reason why the industry is completely shifted why that is how recording gets done is the power that you have uh, for editing capabilities so much easier editing wise tracking wise um, as well as you are only limited to the power of the computer that you're recording so you can run a ridiculous amount of tracks where if you were recording on a 24 track tape recorder um, you would only have 24 tracks or if you had a 16 track multi-track recorder you could only run 16 tracks um, 
inputs or the amount that you can record simultaneously is dependent on the type of interface or what you have plugged into the computer. So there are a lot that go it goes into and a lot that I want to help uh, kind of educate you on a little bit when it comes to computer-based recording. Um, but first off, the DAW, the digital audio workstation, the software that you're going to be recording into, that makes a difference. Um, but it doesn't make as much of a difference as you might think because most recording programs are designed the same way with the same signal concepts, the signal flow concepts. They're just laid out differently. Um, so whether you buy a Mac and get GarageBand for free and use GarageBand out of the gate and have your students work with that, it's a great recording program. Or if you want to budget a little bit more money and invest in Logic, which is kind of GarageBand on steroids, just gives you more features, uh, more tools that you can use, um, that is an option. There's also... Uh, on the PC and Mac side, there's a program called Reaper, Reaper.fm. You can go there, there's a free trial for it. I think it's like $60 um, for that recording program. It's a full featured trial. So you can download it for free, try it out, make sure that you're comfortable with it um, and run that. And then there is the industry standard Pro Tools, Avid Pro Tools is, uh, is what most recordings are done on. Now, not all recordings are done on. There are Billboard top charting songs that have been recorded, parts in GarageBand, parts in Logic, um, parts in Cubase or Nuendo. There are a lot of different recording programs, so I don't want to get hung up too much on them. But Industry Standard is Pro Tools, Avid Pro Tools, and they do have a subscription based instead of having to drop $600 um, to buy the program and then every two years upgrade it for $300. They now do a subscription-based program. So if you have that ability to do that and wanted students to have access to it, they do have Scholastic uh, programs available. Um, so you could look into that. Um, and that any of those programs are going to equip a student um, how to actually work a DAW. Because once you know how to work one, you, you kind of know how they all work. If you have a problem or if you want to, let's say, duplicate a track, you, you, you're gonna be able to figure out how to do that once you're comfortable in a DAW. So, well, now that we've kind of discussed software, we can talk about hardware and there is a signal flow involved in computer-based reco recording and how that signal travels from your instrument or from your microphones through an interface uh, the audio to digital converters gets into the computer, um, lays down on your hard drive, plays back through obviously the program and then back out to the interface, gets converted back to the audio, audio signal, plays through your speakers. So that we'll just talk briefly about that signal flow and then uh, we can dis discuss actual interfaces, actual microphones, things of that nature. So. Um, Interfaces are the key to getting your signal into the computer. An audio interface is what you plug your microphone into, what you plug your guitar into, what you plug anything into that you want to record. And it's going to take that signal, the acoustic energy from the microphone that gets converted to an electrical current that gets sent down through the cable and into that interface. It's going to take that and create a digital version of that to send through a USB cable or firewire cable to the computer and record in your DAW. Um, those come in so many different sizes. Um, you can get them, the most basic is a two in, two out. It's gonna have two inputs on the front, two outputs on the back. So you can run two tracks at the same time. Um, anytime you're looking at an interface, they're, pro they're typically going to give you two numbers, like a two by two is two inputs, two outputs. A two by four would be two inputs, four outputs. A four by two, four inputs, two outputs. Now, why does that matter? Why do the inputs and outputs, the numbers of those matter? You've gotta think through what you wanna be able to record, and not so much what you wanna be able to record, but how much editing capability you'd like to have of that live recording. Now, if you're taking a full band setting, Typically, you can capture a full band setting with two, four, three mics in certain configurations. Um, you can capture a full orchestra with 
four good quality condenser mics or two good quality condenser mics. So you typically look at, if that is all that I want to be able to do, that's, I'd like to be able to hook up enough mics to record a full band. I don't ever see myself recording an acoustic drum set and wanting to be able to mic all eight parts of it or taking an eight piece ensemble and individually mic each one so that I have level control. Um, when you have those multiple inputs on the front, they are recorded as a separate track on the back. So whenever you have those separate tracks, you can go in and mix and edit those individually. You aren't confined to this mic picked up a hundred different instruments. I can't just change the volume of this, if that makes sense. So um, typical band setting, two or four on the input side. The output side, two is standard because that's your stereo left and right. You have headphones on, you have a left and a right, and you can pan sound anywhere in between. Um, the reason why you might want multiple outputs is if you're in a recording setting or if you're using your DAW and your computer for live performance where you want individual outputs of different things. So a couple scenarios just, just so that you kind of have a little bit of an understanding of the multiple outputs. Let's say in a recording studio you have somebody using in-ear monitors, you have the speakers that are in the studio that's your main mix, and then you have a, a, another guy that has in-ear monitors. So you actually have to have three different mixes. The mix of what the engineer is hearing, because that's what he wants to hear, and then, um, uh, then two other mixes for, um, for those two wireless. So you need four outputs, because you have left and right, and then two other outputs. That allows you to send an output um, that is mixed differently than all the other ones to just the one guy's ear earbuds and then that gives you another mix option to send to the other guy's earbuds so they can be mixed however they'd like and uh, and you can still utilize the the studio monitor mix um, where you see these happen more in live sound performances is when you're playing the backing tracks and you hit play and that clicks click tracks going and then they have routed an output that plays along through that DAW that's like the guitar track and that gets sent out of out three and like a bass track gets sent out of out four right into the channels and, and gets played live. That's where you'd see the multiple outputs. Usually the two outs is plenty. Um, and then as far as plugging headphones into it, most of them do have a headphone jack on and you can get headphone amps depending on how many headphones you'd like to hook up to it. So I talked a lot about interfaces there um, and didn't give you much information as far as what uh, what brands and types there are. There, are, Like everything else, there are a lot of them. Roland has a Rubik series that works very well. Everything from a two channel, two in and two out, I have it at home. I use it on a pretty much every couple nights. I'm tracking something or recording something or mixing something. Um, they work fantastic. They have a four channel, a four in, four out. They have eight channels and a 16 channel, a large, uh, large, more of a studio style with the 16 channel. Where you'd want to get into the higher channel count, the eight channel, 16 channel, is typically if you're doing smaller groups where you want to be able to multi-track everything out. You can do, because of the, the power of multi-track recording and how computer-based systems work, even with a two channel mixer, you can layer as many tracks as you want. So I can plug a, a single guitar in, record one track, two tracks, three tracks, right over top of each other. So if you take a big orchestra and take it section by section by section, you can actually multi-track that out with a two channel and do a stereo mix um, for each individual section and come back and re-record. Whether you get the two channel, um, or you get one that would take using eight mics for the entire orchestra. And the, the reason why they typically multi-track that out, the reason why the guitar player in the band records his guitar without the drummer playing or the drummer plays without the singer singing in the same room is so that you don't get as much crosstalk between the microphones. They'll, they'll pick up less. Um, so just a little tidbit of information there for you. Why you when you get to the place where you're going to be recording your band for uh, putting it out there versus and then you have to have you have to be have a good, good conductor be able to conduct based off of a click track or based off of what's playing through his earphones um, 
but you could multi-track that entire recording out and get a really clean recording. The flutes won't be way too loud. The drums won't be way too loud. You can kind of mix everything in together where it needs to be all in the computer. Editing also is a lot easier. If you have that flute section that they, three of the flutists, the flautists, I don't know what word I'm supposed to use there, but three of them mess up and it just, that one spot is not good. Hey, cue us back to, to measure 42. We're gonna count in two measures, play measure 42 through 40 whatever, and that he hit, the recording engineer hits play, or the student that you have that's recording you guys hits play, that click comes in and the band, the conductor conducts, brings everybody back in and they re record that section. Don't make a mistake, you hit play, edit that, put a couple crossfades on so that it's, uh, it's not as apparent and you just fix a problem that if you had two mics set up in the entire band playing at the same time, you wouldn't be able to fix on the spot like that. So there's, there's just a lot of power when it comes to multi-track recording and computer-based recording. Um, but that is, uh, that's all that I really want to mention about interfaces. They start as low as $250. Um, there are some Presonus ones that we get in that are in the 199 ballpark. Um, the Roland just has a great quality mic preamp, um, and then they go up from there. You can spend a lot of money on recording gear, um, microphones too, which is the next area that we're going to talk about. And microphones, there is a lot that we can talk about when it comes to microphones, uh, because they are the bread and butter of capturing what it is. Um, that you want to capture. Typically you're using a mic on a sound source, especially in a band setting. So it's all acoustic instruments. Um, even if you have a digital piano or a, a keyboard player, um, that's going to be the rare exception or an electric guitar player, something like that. Um, typically you're going to be using microphones um, to capture. So I want to talk a little bit about a couple different types of microphones. Um, they're basically either a dynamic microphone or a condenser microphone. Then there are also ribbon microphones. I'll just talk about those two. Why not? Um, your dynamic microphone, it just takes the, uh, the sound, converts that acoustic energy to a signal through the cable, uh, and that is what comes, gets powered and comes through the speaker. They are dynamic in that way. Um, they're more durable. They, they don't typically have a lot of handling noise when you're holding them. Um, they are not as sensitive as a condenser mic. A condenser mic is what is used most often in recording settings when you're trying to capture a high quality sound and because of the amount of sound that it can capture. These take 48 volt phantom power, which is typically provided by the mixer or the interface. 48 volts hits the mic element, causes it to react to the acoustical energy with that a little, little bit of electrical current, and that is what makes it sound a lot more sensitive. That's what makes it be a lot more sensitive. Um, but these are typically the, the microphones that you turn on and the air conditioner kicks on, and you can hear that air conditioner kick on. Um, these are the microphones that typically uh, you see as vocal recordings, acoustic guitar, uh, anything that you want a lot of articulation in. Um, they're also the, the typical microphone used in a stereo pair or a um, other multiple microphone configurations for capturing large sounds uh, or large groups of sounds. Um, so those are, those are typically your room microphones, the overhead drum microphones, or the microphones capturing the band or the orchestra. Um, they're just a lot more sensitive. Uh, pretty much every modern unit that you buy comes standard with 48 volt phantom power now. Old machines back in the day, old mixers back in the day, sometimes you had to buy a phantom power supply, but that's not very common anymore because pretty much everybody knows that you need phantom power in your, uh, in your system to make that microphone work. The third ty type is a ribbon microphone. They're just a ribbon element. Um, they have a figure eight mic puller pattern to them, which means it picks up on two sides. These are the old school mics that you'd see on a talk show host desk that faced because it faced both ways, um, it would pick up sound from both sides. So that's why ribbon mics were common there. It's also this type of mic that you typically see, the Elvis Presley mic looking, the big guy uh, in the studio there. Old ones, you can't, what's interesting is this is just useless information for you. You're welcome. Um, 
old vintage ribbon mics you cannot send phantom power to because they can combust and catch on fire so modern can modern ribbon mics you're okay you can still leave the phantom power on they don't need them you can still leave that phantom power on but if you've got an old high-end recording studio mic that's a ribbon mic you want to make sure that you turn the phantom power off most of us won't have to deal with that um so those are the, the three types of microphones. Typically in the setting that you're going to be getting into, I'd recommend at least a stereo pair of condenser mics to give you a good broad uh, application mic set. Whether those are large diaphragm or the pencil style, the skinnier style, doesn't matter so much um, for recording the band in that setting. I always, I typically lean on large diaphragm condenser mics just because of the tonal characteristics of them uh, when I've got the option between both of them. But the small pencil styles sound great too. They're just a little bit different style microphone. Every microphone is going to have a little bit different tonality to it, a little bit different EQ curve. Um, so they'll all have subtle differences. So getting something that is a good overall broad-based mic, um, like the Audio-Technica AT2020, um, AKG has like a C214, I believe. Um, and then there are a few other options out there, a ton of other options out there that we have access to. Um, but dialing it in on something that is going to, uh, going to cover a broad range um, you don't have to spend a lot of money typically. In a large diaphragm, I usually look around the $200 price range is a good starting place, getting good quality, um, where once you hit that $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 mic, then you're really looking for the nuances, the differences in tonality for the application of what you're recording just versus just getting a good solid universal mic that you're gonna be able to utilize on everything. Um, condenser mics aren't used as often on like a guitar cab or a guitar amp, but they're used most of the time on an acoustic guitar. If you've got um, high SPL instruments that you're close miking, oftentimes we'll use a dynamic mic because dynamic mics are a lot more durable and they can handle higher SPLs. Modern condenser mics they make that can handle really high SPLs too. So where you used to not see as many if you're individually miking a soloist in a studio setting, you used to see more of the instrument mics, the dynamic mics, where a lot of people are using uh, condenser mics for that now uh, as well because you don't have to deal with the high SPL um, as much because the mics are more durable. So either way you go there, um, microphones, will be dependent on what your expectations are of what you want to record. Um, I, I think I've gone like 24, 25 minutes so far. I'm going to try to cut some of the me blabbering out of this. Um, but I just wanted to give you kind of a, a broad overview of some of the things to think about when it comes to recording in general, um, where this information will hopefully help you maybe come up with some of the right questions um, to ask to figure out what's going to serve you best as far as uh, wanting to record. Um, I, don't, I don't think it should be that big of an issue for school bands to be able to record themselves, to be able to offer students the ability to, uh, to have some experience with computer-based recording. Um, it's, it's a great avenue. It's, it's an industry in and of itself. Um, and it, it is it ties into music and technology and so there versus hiring somebody to come in and record your band every year for archiving purposes you could record everything yourself and as far as the concert goes um, being able to get that professional or close to professional sounding recording with equipment that's affordable it's it's easier than you think um, and I I would just say uh, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to leave them in the comments below. My email address is kepi, K-E-P-P-Y, at spotsmusic.com. Feel free to email me directly, um, and I can try to answer any questions that you might have and uh, try, try to help you navigate, get hooked up with gear, get you hooked up with some information. Whatever you need, I'm here for you. And, uh, yeah, I'll try to do some more informational videos like this in the future to kind of help facilitate um, 
getting knowledge in, in different areas like this. So thanks for watching. Hope you have a wonderful day. Peace.